Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Lynn Doyle and this is Meet the Doctors, where each week we look at important health news, medical breakthroughs, and alternative therapies and give you the facts so that you can make educated decisions. Boy, do we have a jam-packed show for you today. We'll be joined by a neurologist who specializes in Parkinson's disease. That's a topic that so many of us are talking about in the wake of Robin Williams' suicide and who hasn't seen the now enormously popular viral ice bucket challenge to raise awareness for ALS, better known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Ow! <laughs> we'll meet a woman who has been devoted to finding a cure since she lost her sister to that disease. And how about those e-cigarettes, you know, the battery powdered devices that you see people puffing on? Well, we're gonna try and clear the air, so to speak, on the smoke versus vapor debate. Can these trendy electronic cigarettes actually be good for you? Blue. When I switched to blue electronic cigarettes, not only did I feel better about myself, I felt the freedom to have a cigarette without the guilt. And of course, we'll have our panel of doctors to answer all of your emails. That's all coming up right after the news. There is a new vaccine against the disease known as chick fever. It's showing promise in early tests in people. That's according to a new study. It's a mosquito-borne virus that can cause debilitating joint pain. Four Americans came down with the virus and another 580 caught it while traveling abroad, many attending the World Cup soccer game in Brazil. That's according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Three common respiratory diseases, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and pneumonia have been linked to an increased risk of lung cancer. That's according to data taken from 25,000 people. Now, people who had all three did have a higher risk of lung cancer than those with just chronic bronchitis. There was also no increased risk of lung cancer for those who had just bronchitis, asthma, or tuberculosis. The FDA has approved Genetex Avastin for a new use against late-stage cervical cancer. The disease is usually caused by the human papillomavirus, which is spread through sexual contact, and it causes cells to become cancerous. The National Cancer Institute estimates that over 12,000 women in the U.S. will be diagnosed with cervical cancer this year, and that another 4,000 will die from it. Experts say Avastin actually chokes off blood vessels that aid new cancer cell growth. It's already approved for various forms of colon cancer, lung cancer, certain kinds of brain tumors, and even kidney cancer. A component of bee venom may block tumor growth in treating some types of cancer. The component, known as melatonin, prevents cancer cells from spreading without harming the patients. Now, because bees only produce a small amount of this venom, researchers actually made synthetic melatonin in the lab to test the theory. Low vitamin D is associated with an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, according to a recent study. Now, whether low vitamin D is a cause of the disorders remain unknown. Scientists did, though, measure blood levels of vitamin D in more than 1,600 men and women who were about 73 years old. They did not have dementia at the start of the study, and over an average follow-up of more than five years, only 171 developed dementia. Now, it's been less than two weeks since Robin Williams killed himself, and as you know, his wife later disclosed that he had Parkinson's disease. Well, Intel Corporation, the microchip giant, is now teaming with the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research to fight this terrible disease. Volunteers will use wearable technologies that will gather, transmit, and analyze in real time the slowness of movement, tremors, and sleep quality. As you know, the Spin City Star was diagnosed in 1991. Because I put the brush down on the countertop, hold it flat and get the bristles on because if I hold it, I'm, I'll miss it. It's a moving target. But anyway, once I get all loaded up, then I just kind of bring it up to my mouth and then just let it go. We'll talk about cutting edge research for Parkinson's and ALS later in the show. Finally, a large international study bucks conventional wisdom that people should cut back on salt, especially those who have high blood pressure. Sodium contributes to about 1.65 million deaths a year, but too little may actually be as bad as too much. For more information on this, we go to Newsmax Deputy Health Editor, Nick Tate. Hey, Nick, should we take these new findings with uh, a grain of salt? 
Well, you know, the study was a big one. It involved more than 100,000 people in 17 countries, which makes it one of the largest that's ever been done on this topic. And what they found is that cutting salt really only makes sense for people who eat a lot of salt or who have very high blood pressure. What's more, salt levels that are too low are really risky. People who consume between two and three teaspoons of salt a day had the lowest risk of heart problems, and those who had lower had higher risks. Now, the average American consumes about two to four teaspoons a day, so most of us are in the safe range. Those who ate less, as I said, had higher risks, even though the American Heart Association advises that most people on a low salt, salt diet not consume more than one teaspoon a day. All right, thanks a lot, Nick. Up next, is the e-cigarette really a healthy alternative to tobacco products? One study says yes. We'll find out what our experts say right after this. Stay with us. I'm not really sure if I would switch to an e-cigarette if I thought they were that so harmful, but only because I've been smoking for a lot of years and I'm a, pretty much a creature of habit, so it'd be a hard habit to break. I tried that at one time, and to me I started coughing more, so I just went back to the, the hard stuff. I mean, there's 10,000 toxins in a cigarette, and there's about 32 toxins in an electronic cigarette. It's the lesser of two evils. I'm just not sure what the ingredients are in e-cigarettes, so I tend to stay away from them. I think they're less harmful, but I think either way, you're still smoking, you're still taking something into your lungs. I use electronic cigarettes for work, for movie theaters, for restaurants, for places where I can get away with smoking them. I don't want to have another habit. Like, I don't want to change my habit for something else. I prefer actually smoking a real cigarette, holding it in my hand, being able to pull on something and the actual smoke and the burning of it, the smell of it. Has a lot to do with why I enjoy smoking. Now, those are some of the reasons those individuals either enjoy the e-cigarettes or will not yet consider it. We're going to find out more about this new trend from our deputy health editor, Nick Tate. You know, Lynn, what this latest research showed was not that e-cigarettes are safe, but in fact that any risks that they may pose are far lower than risks posed by traditional cigarettes and tobacco products. You know, ever since e-cigarettes hit the market several years ago, there's been a great debate, debate and a great divide among health experts. On the one hand, some people feel that e-cigarettes are a better alternative to tobacco. They don't cause cancer, they don't, we don't believe they cause significant respiratory effects, and they can be a big bridge for smokers to quit. On the other hand, other health experts believe that we just don't know enough about e-cigarettes and the risks they pose in the long term because they have not been on the market long enough and so they are pressing the FDA to regulate e-cigarettes perhaps as aggressively as tobacco. Now, this latest study by uh, Virginia Commonwealth University looked at 81 different studies to try to uh, resolve that debate and they clearly came down in favor of e-cigarettes saying that in fact they don't pose a significant enough a risk that the FDA should be strongly regulating them. But the American Medical Association, the American Lung Association, and other health groups have been saying that the FDA really needs to step forward. So what will be interesting to see is how the FDA deals with the latest research and sorts out the continuing debate among health experts. All right, thanks very much, Nick. Let's talk a little bit more about this with a couple of pulmonologists. Joining me here in our New York studio is Dr. Ravindra Rajmani of NYU Langone Medical Center, along with Dr. Zachary Bregman, who is also a pulmonologist and an internist. Gentlemen, it's good to have you with us. Thank nice you. Thank so you. I want to hear it from you guys who deal with this and the effects of smoking day in and day out. Is this a good thing or not? So, Lynn, I think it's important to understand exactly what Nick said and that uh, we're talking about harm reduction. So we're talking about specifically an alternative to cigarette smoking. I'd like to underscore at the outset that our parent bodies, our governing bodies, advisory bodies, including the American Lung Association, but also the American Thoracic Society, have both strongly come out with uh, caution about e-cigarettes and specifically that uh, there should be more oversight by the FDA 
What is there to be concerned about? You would think that anything that would keep people from smoking would be a good thing, and yet there are some precautions that you want people right. to know about. Well, of course, um, the use of e-cigarettes in, in, in as part of smoking cessation is really not necessarily the largest um, group of people who are using e-cigarettes. Unfortunately, there is a whole new population of people who are starting out uh, smoking, by smoking or vaping e-cigarettes. And in right? fact, there's no now, regulation No, there's no them, regulation, right? but of course, kids used to smoke cigarettes even though they had some more regulation than these currently do. The behavior is cannot be regulated. So when, or it's more difficult to regulate it. So when these are available to, um, to people, including unfortunately children, um, they will get used and therefore we'll be introducing a new substance um, that doesn't seem to be dangerous at this point. But that whole population would otherwise not be smoking anything. Let's talk a little bit about the vapor itself. Are there dangers that are associated with it? Are there chemicals included in that vapor? So that's an excellent question and a difficult question to answer. Part of the difficulty is that uh, there's really no regulation about what constituents are within a vapor cigarette. You can pretty much add whatever you'd like and flavor it into, as uh, Dr. Bergman was saying, to uh, flavor it to appeal to for perhaps younger consumers with uh, interesting spices or fruit flavors. So having said that, though nicotine is usually a mainstay of most of these cigarettes, again, but the amount of nicotine is not readily quantified. Beyond the nicotine, uh, there are also some concerns about formaldehyde as a byproduct. I think several studies have indicated that that level is uh, probably lower than toxic levels, even in heavy users. It doesn't sound good, though, to be ingesting formaldehyde. Right. It's better not to be exposing the very um, fragile tissue of your lungs to anything other than clean air, if possible. And actually, so there, uh, if you look at this discussion, you'll find studies on both sides. Um, while most of the meta-analyses, the reviews, indicate that, uh, that e-cigarettes are certainly useful as harm reduction for patients who want to quit smoking and also verify that, these uh, that the constituents are relatively harmless, my concern is that we don't really know exactly the long-term effects. There's been a recent in vitro study, a multicenter study from Boston University with the lead author at UCLA where they look at patients, where actually they look at cells, lung cells, that have a procl proclivity to developing lung cancer. And when exposed to particles within the vapor, there actually have been some abnormalities uh, seen in those cell lines. Yeah. Now and this is actually an example of an e-cigarette. Okay, so how does it work? How does an individual use it, and what does that person get from using it? Well, the mechanics I, is you pour in a liquid, um, which is usually uh, carried by uh, uh, propylene glycol, um, which is maybe where some of the formaldehyde comes from. And uh, then you, there's a battery in there, you press a button, and that vaporizes it, and you smoke it, or okay. vape it, I guess. Right. <laughs> so an important distinction that proponents of e-cigarettes make is that there's actually no combustion. There's vaporization and, uh, and that propylene glycol and uh, glycerol, which are sort of the diluents, so to speak, are pretty harmless. And uh, they actually are used in making uh, commercial fog for concerts and uh, movie sets. Now, I have to ask as a non-smoker, will I be offended by someone who is using an e-cigarette? Well, that, of course, is a personal... You mean will it smell badly? Exactly. Um, it, not in the same way that. Will a regular I be cigarette. exposed to secondhand smoke? Like well, I am if someone's smoking a but cigarette. But remember, this is not smoke. This is vapor. Okay. And so it's very different. So, and the main difference is that there's no particulate matter in it, or one of the main differences. Okay. And so the, the irritating aspects of cigarette smoke are the particulate matter, which this does not have. I think I speak for both of you when I say people should just try to quit smoking or not start, right? Absolutely. Correct. Okay.
Well, thank you both so much for being with us. We certainly appreciate your perspective on this issue. Now, coming up next, we're going to be talking about Parkinson's disease because, as you know, it's in the news now because of Robin Williams and his diagnosis of it. And we'll also be talking about that so-called ice bucket challenge. It's bringing a whole new awareness to the disease ALS. Stay with us for information on that and much more as Meet the Doctors continues. Welcome back to Meet the Doctors, I'm Lynn Doyle. We're gonna spend this next segment talking about two neurological diseases that have been in the headlines of late, Parkinson's disease and ALS. We've been talking about Parkinson's because of Robin Williams' diagnosis, and of course we've been talking about ALS because of the so-called ice bucket challenge that's been making its rounds around the internet. And why not? <gasps> oh, Jesus. <That's... sighs> oh. Thank you. Here to help us do that, a very distinguished panel of experts. Dr. Daphne Rabakis is a neurologist at New York Presbyterian Hospital who specializes in Parkinson's. Valerie Estes is an ALS advocate who lost her sister Jennifer to that disease. And Dr. Jeffrey Gardier is a psychologist who often deals with depression associated with both of these. Thank you all so much for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate your time. I want to start with Dr. Rabakis. For those who are not familiar with Parkinson's, what exactly is it and what kind of impact does it have on our bodies? So Parkinson's disease is a progressive disorder. It starts in the brain and is caused by cells in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra that start to die off and are no longer able to produce a substance called dopamine. And, and that we need causes, that, right? We need that right. to be able to function with our motor skills? That's very important in movement and coordination. So when you say that it's degenerative, it starts off in one way and then over time it gets worse and Slowly worse. Slowly over time, yes. We've it's seen that with uh, actor Michael J. Fox, mm -hmm. for example, and yet he's still able to function. Is it a so-called death sentence if someone hears that they've gotten Parkinson's definitely disease? Definitely not. Um, and anyone with a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease should definitely not think that it's a death sentence or even that they're sentenced to be in a wheelchair. Um, we have really excellent uh, treatments and medications right now to help control the symptoms of Parkinson's and really to alleviate suffering. The patients are able to go about their daily lives and even continue working and enjoying all the hobbies that they have enjoyed even before their diagnosis. Is this one of those diseases where we are seeing a progression in the treatment and people are living longer and living a better quality of life with the, with the disease? Yes, I would definitely say that, you know, since the first treatment um, called levodopa was discovered about 50 years ago, there have been many new drugs that have uh, come about that are really very effective in treating the different symptoms and an experienced neurologist is able to use all of these drugs together and uh, really alleviate suffering in patients. What symptoms would we be showing that could cause us to seek out a medical opinion on whether or not we have Parkinson's? That's a very good question. So um, very common uh, complaints that a patient may have who um, is in the early stages of Parkinson's would include stiffness or slowing down, trouble using their hands, for example, having difficulty writing or trouble doing buttons. Some uh, may notice that their loved one may have uh, decreased arm swing, for example, when they're walking. So those sorts of things. Okay. Another uh, disease that we've been hearing more and more about lately because of the so-called ice bucket challenge is ALS, or commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And Valerie, your um, sister, Jennifer, actually succumbed to the disease. Can you tell me what kind of impact it had on her and then you as a family? Sure, so my sister Jennifer was 35 when she was diagnosed with ALS seemingly out of nowhere. Yeah. So before she, she gave over to ALS, she certainly wanted to fight it. And so Jennifer, my sister Meredith and I started Project ALS as a non-profit effort. As a non-profit effort, 
to organize doctors and scientists in a new way to work more effectively toward treatments and ultimately a cure. Do you think that right now doctors and physicians are competing against each other instead of working collaboratively? Well, that's a great question. So I think when Jennifer was diagnosed in the late 90s, that was definitely the case. I think that researchers were competing for limited uh, research dollars. And I think one of the things that Project ALS has done has got is uh, we've gotten doctors who were formerly competitors into a room to start sharing ideas and let's fund the whole thing. Um, you know, ALS is a very complicated brain disease. It's actually a first cousin, we, the doctor and I were talking about this earlier, to Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Um, and they're very complicated diseases and the more doctors work together on them, the faster we're going to get to effective treatment. So that's what Project ALS is all about. And ALS is truly debilitating and eventually takes over an entire body, but often the mind is left completely intact. That's right, and my sister Jennifer was a great example of someone whose mind was much stronger than the disease, and uh, Project ALS continues to fight in her spirit to raise money for collaborative research. Now, Doctor, a lot of people think that Robin Williams' suicide may have been tied in with his recent diagnosis of having Parkinson's disease. A lot of doctors are trying to get the message out that it does not have to be a death sentence, and it does not have to lead you to such a an act as, as suicide. Well, absolutely, and that's if you're able to work with that individual, as we've talked about, getting the physicians, to work with family members, uh, to be able to support that individual, to be able to look at what the initial signs of Parkinson's or ALS may uh, be. With Robin Williams, that was a very interesting case because, uh, as the good doctor will tell you, uh, this neurotransmitter, dopamine, uh, if you don't have enough of it, of course, it causes uh, uh, movement diseases, coordination uh, uh, issues. Uh, but the other thing is, if you don't have enough dopamine, it also causes depression. So what we're seeing is the interplay between, yes, finding out that you have Parkinson's, which is a very serious illness and a disease, and at the same time, not having enough dopamine that gives you uh, what you need in order to be happy. So there is the interplay in the two and what we think might have happened with Robin Williams. But I can't imagine hearing those words from a doctor, you have Parkinson's, you have ALS, and not automatically being depressed because you feel like your whole life as you know it is ending. Well, absolutely, and that's where we see the support groups are very, very helpful. Uh, of course, getting the psychotherapy. We do know with uh, Parkinson's, yes, we talk about Aldopa as being one of uh, the treatments, but also looking at antidepressants to get the dopamine flowing. And we also see with ALS that there is not a remarkable rate of depression as one would think, even though it can be so debilitating, uh, it's actually worse in other uh, degenerative issues. So again, it's about addressing it and having hope, knowing that it's not a death sentence, that you can live for some people, they don't live very long, right. but for others, they actually can have a rewarding and fulfilling life. Valerie, what do you think about this yeah. ice bucket challenge and oh, the attention gracious. and the money that it's raised so for So Project ALS, ALS is, is getting donations in every minute. It's like another batch of Toll House coming <laughs> out of the oven, which is always good news to me. But yes. um, <laughs> uh, the, the great news is that organizations that are devoted to patient services and patient support are thriving. Project ALS, is, which is devoted 100% to scientific research, is thriving. And people are having a good time and learning about a disease that will touch all of us. And finally, when someone like Robin Williams or Michael J. Fox is associated with Parkinson's, it also raises awareness and creates a dialogue like this. Definitely, which is at least one good uh, positive point that we can take from all this negativity. And, yeah. and the other thing is, please, Let's look at depression. Let's treat depression apart from these two illnesses. A lot of people feel that depression is something you just get over. You don't. It does need treatment. You know, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because earlier on the show when we talked about depression, we talked about talking about mental illness as as important as physical illness, and we need to get rid of that stigma that's associated with Absolutely. it. Dr. Gardier, Valerie, thank you, doctor, um, for being with us, and we certainly appreciate you watching as well. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Meet the Doctors, I'm Lynn Doyle. This is actually the part of the show where you do get to meet the doctors. You write in your questions and we have our panel of experts to try to address some of your issues. Let's meet this week's panel. We're joined once again by Dr. Rajmani, along with Newsmax contributor, Dr. Erica Schwartz. And joining us from our Florida studio is Dr. Peter Hibbert, who is an emergency medicine physician. As always, it's great to have all of you with us. Let's start with you, Dr. Hibbert. This question says, I'm thinking about taking niacin for my heart condition, but I've heard that it could be risky. What do you think? I think not. <laughs> uh, niacin, I used to, we used to all use niacin, and uh, I got so many patients coming in complaining of flushing, and some with high sugars, their diabetes went a little out, some had liver function troubles, and the rest of them had troubles with side effects when the statins were added. The um, guidelines recently have changed uh, with re regarding to the things we add to statins. Statins are now seen as a mainstay for most of our lipid disorders. Uh, we used to add niacin. We now sway away from it. There are too many side effects for the average person to, to recommend they all use it. There may be select circumstances when it may be a choice your doctor uses, but as a general rule, the sway is away from niacin right now. Okay, thank you for your opinion. Let me ask the doctors here in the studio with me if you concur. Absolutely. Actually, um, there was a study published in the New England Journal July 16th this year that actually showed that niacin was more dangerous than expected, even though it was a drug that is often prescribed and it has a combination between the long-acting part of it and the B3, which is niacin. Um, but the problem is that we're writing too many prescriptions for niacin. So based on the study, we're not writing for niacin anymore. And people are buying niacin over the counter a lot. And there's no flush niacin. There are a lot of supplements that have niacin. So bring down the dosage and talk to your doctor. And that's what we always suggest, that you talk to your doctor. We have a question about another very popular uh, medicine. This one says, my husband started taking a baby aspirin every day after his doctor recommended it. Heart disease runs in his family, you see. But even a minor cut causes profuse bleeding in him. Is this normal? One of our New York doctors want to address that? Sure. Uh, so certainly baby aspirin, which is just 81 milligrams, is a small dose. And certainly platelets we know uh, are uh, destabilized with the use of aspirin. However, it is not a permanent destabilization, and it should not cause substantial bleeding. So my caution would be for, for this individual to have a comprehensive hematologic workup and to look for other problems, for example, liver disease or drug interactions. If this patient's on aspirin, aspirin pretty well tolerated. However, there can be other drug interactions. And then finally, if there is any significant bleeding that's external, the concern is that there may be internal bleeding as well. So a comprehensive hemoglobin assessment should be done. Okay, thanks very much. Dr. Hibbard, this one says, I eat mostly a vegan diet, cereal for breakfast, a veggie, veggie burger or a salad for lunch, vegetables for dinner. Do I need to worry about getting more protein? Well, I think it depends upon how you've structured your diet. As a general rule, if you eat uh, a veggie diet, then your risks for uh, the, 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 the meat lover's diet, cholesterol accumulation issues, are going to be less. Uh, we always said if you eat like a rabbit, you're going to come out a little better in, on your vessel side. So <laughs> as far as your protein load, I think, I think you really need to see a dietitian and sit down with someone to really assess what your protein load is and what your protein needs are, and then work from there. Okay. Dr. Erica? Well, the average, you know, just to give people an idea, the average person consumes about 50 grams of protein a day. So then there are all kinds of formulas that take into consideration how tall you are, how much you weigh, and how much protein you should eat. But 50 grams is a good number to keep in mind, and vegetarians in general wind up not eating enough protein. However, I must say, as, uh, <laughs> since I was born a vegetarian, and uh, certainly over a billion people in South Asia are vegetarians, um, that uh, I think the amount of protein in a diet, particularly in Western diets, is a little bit uh, uh, overemphasized. Certainly a gram of protein per kilogram is a recommendation. And even in the ICU, when we have patients with tremendous catabolic needs, and a lot of tissue breakdown and muscle breakdown, we only go to 1.3 to 1.5, and 
Now, mind you, protein, I think it's a misnomer of uh, the food network, et cetera, of saying <laughs> it's just meats. Right. Protein is not just meats. Certainly, plenty of legumes, for example, have uh, incredible protein loads. Good right. advice. Like beans, I mean, we talk about tofu. Lentils. Uh, lentils, we're eating protein all the time. Right. Right. So I think uh, an overemphasis on meat is not the answer, but certainly right. consult a dietitian and uh, make sure you have a balanced diet. Right. Always good advice. All right, Dr. Hibbert, here's one. Does Propecia stop hair loss or help grow it back? I've also heard it can be used to help your prostate when you get older. Can you clarify, is this true? Well, actually, uh, Propecia is actually a fractional dose of a drug we use to uh, help shrink the prostate back. So um, there's a drug called Proscar that basically Propecia is a core to strength of that. So the bottom line is, yes, Propecia at the lower doses, does it have an effect on your prostate? Probably not enough. The FDA clearance dose is, is four times the, the dose of the Propecia tablet in order to have any effect on the prostate size or shrinking it back. So I doubt you're going to see an effect on prostate at the low dose that Propecia offers you. On the other hand, Propecia use actually does block the dihydrotestosterone stimulation in the hair follicle, and it will prevent ongoing hair loss. Now, will it grow it back? Uh, I think there's some question about it, it will help stop the loss of hair. It will not always, actually most of the time, it doesn't grow it back. But there are some people who start it who end up with a whole growth of hair that they didn't have or haven't had for five or ten years. So I see it going both directions. I really can't answer that question any better than that. Well, so I it's think variable according to the individual. Okay, well I think you did a very fine job of answering it for us and we always ask our doctors to give their opinion but then we suggest that you meet with your medical professional before you make any decisions. We have to take a quick break but when we come back we'll have more of your questions and more of their answers. So I hope that you'll stay with us here on Meet the Doctors. Let's continue here with our panel of doctors answering our viewer email medical questions. Again, I always remind you that this is their opinion when they give you the answer. You should always seek your own medical opinion from your own doctor. All right, Dr. Erica Schwartz, we have another question for you. This one says, is there a drug-free alternative to managing my rheumatoid arthritis? I don't want to load up on painkillers. Sounds like this viewer actually heard you talk about the over-prescribing right. that doctors do. Yeah, I know. And you know what, congratulations to this person for really actually trying. You know, I'm going to give you a couple of um, answers and then I guess Dr. Rajvani can work with me on this. Um, I would think that the first thing is exercise. If you exercise, you will actually lubricate those joints and the pain will diminish as much as to begin with seems like a really difficult idea. Then physical therapy, occupational therapy, moving, connecting, engaging, there are a lot of things. As far as supplements, omega-3 fish oils are important. They're as strong at times as anti-inflammatories, and they don't have the side effects of anti-inflammatories. So certainly I think these are uh, measures that can be drug-free measures, but uh, I think I want to draw the distinction between painkillers, Lynn, and anti-inflammatory agents. Many anti-inflammatory agents nowadays are targeted specifically, for example, tumor necrosis factor inhibitors and uh, those have a, f a fewer a side effect or a more moderate side effect profile than drugs that are strictly pain relievers. There is an inflammation, and we're talking about usually smaller joints uh, associated with rheumatoid arthritis, so the inflammation can be fairly debilitating. Um, what's also important to say about rheumatoid arthritis is that it, can, it is a systemic disease, and as a pulmonologist, for example, we often see men in particular who present with pulmonary symptoms before they actually have joint disease. 
Okay, thank you very much. Let's go back to Dr. Hibbert, who is in our South Florida studios. We have a question. If you can tell us whether or not there is a definitive test for Parkinson's disease, sometimes my hands shake and I can't seem to stop it. Earlier in the show, we talked about that. It obviously generated this question from our viewer. I wish I could answer that there was a test for Parkinson's disease. The only test we really have is a directed history and a physical examination. We do not have a specific test to tell you that you have Parkinson's disease except by the judgment of the doctor you see. And so when you have somebody that you see who says you have Parkinson's, then you know you need to go ahead and ask them why and on what basis and understand whether it is that you have an early case or one that they think might be. And if you're not sure, you can always ask for a referral to a neurologist for a second opinion. Okay. And in that case, then, of course, the next question is, do you need medicine now, or is this something that you should wait on till later on? Okay, here's another one for you, Dr. Hibbert. I know you probably get some strange cases in the emergency room. It asks, I itch all the time yeah. all over my body. What should I ask my doctor to test for? This has been going on for months now. I can only imagine that this has been driving this viewer crazy. Well, there's honestly nothing more disturbing than having a patient to come into you to tell you that they're itching and then they start scratching all over. Uh, we even, as examiners, end up feeling itchy ourselves. Uh, in a, on a more serious note, um, there are situations where you've got an allergic response or a sensitivity to soap or detergent or fabric softeners. And they're the usual causes of itches. And sometimes it's in the clothing and in the sweat and the foods we eat. And we're sweating into the clothing and it's a contact sort of issue. Other times, itching all over can be a very serious early warning sign of something going wrong inside. And in all truthfulness, if you don't know why you're itching, you should go to your doctor because I don't want to set any alarms out, but sometimes even an internal malignancy like a pancreatic mm -hmm. cancer or a little lymphoma or something like this can start out just with a generalized feeling of itch without any seeming response to an antihistamine or incomplete response, okay. and it keeps recurring. And um, even renal cell carcinomas are known to do this also. So some selective malignancies can start out this way. So bottom line is don't treat this thing if it's not responding to your antihistamines and your detective work in topicals and soaps and detergents. Go see your doc and make sure it's nothing else. Okay, I hope that helps our viewer. We have time for just maybe one or two more questions. Dr. Erica, this one says, my husband says I talk in my sleep. Sometimes I have scary dreams. Are these signs of sleep apnea? Not necessarily. No. Actually, the signs of sleep apnea are waking up in the morning with a dry throat, choking in the middle of the night and waking up, waking yourself up, um, having breathing problems. And, you know, sleep apnea usually is not connected to dreams. It's usually connected to more symptomatic things. Actually, like breathing issues breathing sometimes, issues, right? right. So Sleep apnea occurs and you really have fragmented sleep. You may, right. you often don't have REM sleep right. in which you would dream. Um, so there are a subset of uh, uh, what we call parasomnias, which are, can be subsetted even further into something called night terrors. And these are actually uh, disturbances in sleep architecture. So a sleep study actually would address both, right. both issues, sleep apnea and uh, these parasomnias. Very quickly, what kind of doctor would do that for her? So sleep. certainly as a pulmonologist many of us are uh, board certified in sleep medicine. Neurologists are also capable of handling this. There's sleep centers so all over so. academic okay. centers. Um, I hope she'll take that good advice. She <laughs> thank you much, so much for being with us. Wonderful to have you here. Dr. Hibbert, thank you for being with us as well. Thank you. thank you. And as always we want to thank you for watching Meet the Doctors. We always appreciate hearing from you so if you have a question please send it in to us and we'll do what we can to help you. Until the next time, this is Meet the Doctors. I'm Lynn Doyle.